Sounds good. Okay, off we go. All right, uh, so thank you all for coming. Uh, Aaron Vick ta talking about the problem of sea level rise and projections, what we know and what we don't know. Um, and I'm going to draw upon work uh, with a number of collaborators who are, are shown here um, and many others as well. Uh, I particularly want to flag that this talk will include contributions from DJ Rasmussen, who has a related poster out in the hallway that you should stop by and see at some point. Um, so I will be very brief. I, all my here are all my conclusions. Um, basically, two, two sets of points. So one, a variety of approaches are used to project how likely different global and local sea level changes are. And despite that variety, they largely give consistent answers through about the middle of the century. But they start diverging considerably thereafter. The main driver of this divergence, which I'm going to call deep uncertainty or ambiguity, reflecting the fact that different reasonable approaches give widely differing answers of how likely different outcomes are, are one, emissions, uh, which we it's just hard to put a probability distribution on, and therefore, if you have things that depend upon emission, it's hard to put a probability distribution on them, and two, ice sheet dynamics. Uh, and then sort of the, the, the punchline is that this ambiguity leads to a large spread in estimates of the changes of the extreme sea level of hazard, uh, the changes in how frequently we're going to see large floods, essentially, that may not be resolvable soon. And yet, we have to make decisions today that are going to be affecting our vulnerability to extreme sea levels during this period of deep uncertainty. And that's sort of a core problem. Uh, you know, physical science can identify the problem, but it's really a core problem on the decision science and social science side and policy side as well. Uh, so one approach one might go about trying to project sea level rise is an approach that was actually pioneered uh, by Vivian Gornitz over here in a 1982 paper in Science, which is, I think, the first modern scientific projections uh, of sea level change. Um, and it, this is a particular variant, but the basic idea is looking at statistical relationships between past temperature changes and past global average sea level changes and, and assuming those relationships held, um, for, hold going forward. So this is, particular curve is showing you a temperature and a sea level curve for the last 2,000 years that Klaus Bitterman, who was a graduate student at Pick at the time, uh, worked with, uh, with a number of us. Um, and I can go into the details, but, but the bottom line is, if you look at the statistical relationship between temperature and sea level over the last thousand years, you pr project by the end of the century that we would be looking at somewhere between about 50 and 130 centimeters of global mean sea level rise under a high emissions future, about 20 to 60 centimeters under a low emissions future. But doing this sort of approach, first of all, it projects global changes, not local changes. And so it's an incomplete approach, even if you're thinking about lo just local risk management. And it's calibrated from a time period where the main drivers of sea level change are the uptake of heat by the ocean, or the uh, release of heat by the ocean, um, and changes in mountain glaciers. And we're projecting forward to a time where we can already see ice sheets taking on a larger role. So there's a reason to be somewhat skeptical of these projections. So another approach um, is sort of a bottom-up accounting method-based approach. And, our, and this is a family of approaches generally known as probabilistic sea level rise projections. Our work in this area um, was originally motivated by a demand for quantitative economic risk analysis. And actually, the first sort of side of science sea level projections in this vein dates back to a 1995 EPA study with a similar motivation. Um, and so this, this framework I'm about to show you grew out of something called the Risky Business Project, which was led by Mayor Bloomberg. Um, tre former Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson and Tom Steyer and led to the uh, Columbia University Press book published on the, on the left there. And this framework, which I, again I'll show you the details uh, in a second, has been widely used in the U.S. by stakeholder-driven assessments. It underlies official projections in Washington, Oregon, California, Maryland, and Delaware um, with modification in Boston, uh, with significant modification in the fourth national climate assessment, as well as um, semi-official projections uh, in, in New Jersey. So here, here's what we do. It's, as I said, it's basically an accounting method. So the idea is, well, we have bits and pieces. There is currently no one physical model that projects all of the different contributions to sea level rise. And even if there was, it would probably be hard to do uncertainty analysis with it. So we draw upon a range of different information sources. Um, in some cases, 
for, say, things like land subsidence. We're looking at essentially the continuation of historical trends. That's what's shown here as non-climatic background. For things like the global contribution of groundwater withdrawal and dam reconstruction, we look at statistical relationships between things like um, past impoundment of water and dam, past groundwater withdrawal, and global population. Uh, for thermal expansion and ocean dynamics, that's where global climate models um, sort of really shine. And so following approaches used by groups like the IPCC and the New York City Panel on Climate Change, we, we more or less use those directly. Um, glaciers, physics are relatively simple. Uh, you have accumulation uh, due to, to snowfall. You have melt due to heat. Um, and so if you have a model driven by a of that, those processes driven by a climate model, you can draw upon that. Uh, and then there's the ice sheets. Um, and ice sheets are very hard to model at a continental scale. There's been a lot of advances in the last few years, but it, they're still very hard, as I'll get to in a second. So in this approach, uh, we use a combination of consensus-based expert assessment reflected in things like the way the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change works, and a method I'll talk about a little bit more in detail called structured expert judgment, which is a way of sort of pooling estimates of likelihood from different experts that avoids some of the pitfalls of a, of a consensus method um, and also avoids uh, sort of overweighting people who may be overconfident. I'll talk about that when we get to a new expert participant study. Um, one of the reasons this framework has been widely used is that we've been put a lot of effort into making it relatively available. So the code underlying it is downloadable on, on GitHub. You can also get some, some slices through this at tie gauges around the U.S. Um, using uh, Climate Central Surging Sea Risk Finder. Um, and here's sort of the punchline. So this is uh, the way we will we'll come up the numbers looking at our, our 2014 approach. Um, so between 2000 and 2030, we're looking at likely about uh, 10 to 20 centimeters of sea level, global average sea level rise. 2000 to 2050, roughly about 20 to 40 centimeters, so roughly a foot. And that starts to deliver, uh, de exhibit a little bit of sensitivity to emissions, but it's pretty small. And by 2100, we're looking at very likely about 50 to 120 centimeters under high emissions and 30 to 80 centimeters under low emissions. If you happen to remember the numbers I showed you at the beginning, that statistical numbers are almost exactly the same. But the ice sheets, as I mentioned, are really hard. The physics of the interactions between ice sheets and the ocean is complex, and the state of scientific understanding is rapidly evolving. Uh, for example, uh, a paper uh, by Rob DeCanto and Dave Pollard uh, three years ago now uh, sort of introduced into continental scale ice sheet model for the first time a new f physical process that hadn't been previously incorporated having to do with the fracturing of ice shelves uh, by, by the ponding of meltwater and the subsequent collapse under their own weight of ice cliffs when they're left exposed to the open ocean. And they found that simply including this process, which is hard to calibrate, uh, could have the potential to lead to dramatically ra larger increases in rates of, of Antarctic melt and consequent sea level rise. Um, so a couple of years ago, to look at the implications of that, we essentially did our same study where we brought in this new Antarctic information. Um, and again, I want, before I show you the number, I want to caution that this is, you know, these are rapidly evolving. What you can learn from this is not a new set of better numbers, but a sense of where the, the deeper levels of uncertainty are. Um, did not make much difference for 2050. Did not make much difference uh, for 2100 under a low emission scenario. But when you start incorporating these processes, it makes a potentially huge difference for 2100 under a high emission scenario. So the, what I would call the sluggish ice, the traditional model giving you 50 to 120 centimeters. With this fast ice model, we were looking instead at 90 to 240 centimeters. So at the high end, twice the previous high end. Now, I mentioned, promised I would come back to structured expert judgment. Uh, here is a photo from a structured expert judgment study we did uh, at the beginning of, of 2018 uh, with resources for the future in, in DC. Um, so we brought together a panel of experts from the U.S., and there was a parallel panel in Europe. Um, and basically what we're doing is, is asking experts to judge the likelihood of different courses of, of the things that affect ice sheet contribution to sea level. So how will melt change? How will discharge change? How will accumulation change? What's their estimates of the distribution? But then, and this is not just a poll. It's not just a survey, because you're also asking the experts 
answers to questions to which it is possible to currently know the answers. And you are calibrating how much weight you give an expert by their ability to estimate their own uncertainty. Right? So you want to downweight somebody who may be very confident in what they think is going to happen in the future, but is also very confident about what the correct answer to something observable is, and they happen to be off in a way that, that suggested they're not doing a good job of estimating their own uncertainty. So quickly, not much change in 2050, slight change in 2100. When we look at the expert judgment, which is sort of a measure of the temperature of the scientific understanding has of early 2018, the low end of the range looks like the low end of the traditional numbers. The high end of the range looks like the high end of the DeCanto and Pollard numbers. So we end up around a range of 60 to 240 centimeters. Lower median projection, considerably fatter tail. So what does that uh, uh, mean in terms of extreme sea levels and when we might expect, for instance, to have to make uh, a retreat as something we're considering in different areas? Um, so. DJ came in late. I already highlighted his work, but I just want to note he's sitting, he's sitting down here, and he's responsible for the data analysis here. Um, so here what I'm showing you is the expected number of one in 100-year events. So under baseline, that would be 0.01 per year, so the deep red. Um, and then at the bottom of the text, what it is in New York City. And I'm going to go through a few time periods and scenarios. So this is a 2050 number. They all look very much the same depending on regardless of what distribution we're using. So we start to see, in, even by 2050, there are some areas that are turning blue, meaning the one in a hundred year event is now expected more than once a year on average. New York City, we've gone from one in a hundred years to one per 25 years. Now, if we go to 2080 under the low emission scenario and sort of the s slow ice, New York City, we're still seeing a lot more blue. Uh, New York City, we're at about a one per two year for that historic one in a hundred year flood. Under a high emission scenario and the slow ice model, we're at about one per year, and we're starting to see a, a lot more blue. And then here is under the fast ice model. So the really dark blue representing essentially permanent flooding starting to be at the one in a historic one in a hundred year level becoming more common. New York City, we're getting a one in a hundred, expecting a one in a hundred year extreme water level about 20 times a year. So it's become the, the new high tide flood. So what do you do if you're making decisions where you might need to know today something about sea level in 2080, infrastructure, land use, even buyouts, that will affect vulnerability in 2080? And yet different reasonable approaches indicate that in 2080, we should expect a one in 100 year extreme sea level event on average, maybe once every other year if we keep emissions down, once a year if we don't, but we are relatively lucky, or 20 times per year if we don't and we, we're using the guidance of, of some of the more, more worried and uh, experts who essentially have incorporated the unexpected into their distribution. I don't have an answer for you. Uh, <laughs> but I leave that question up because I think it's, it's a sort of critical thing for us to be thinking about. I mean, I do have, have some answers, but those will be other talks. Um, a critical thing for us to be thinking about as we, as we go forward with this discussion. I think that's So it's, well, because it's, it's I, I think a lot of people have a lot of skepticism about the DeCanto Pollard model, including Rob and Dave, right? This is, this is not the most recent unpublished version of their model. What their study is revealing is that there's physics that weren't previously incorporated that dramatically raised the number, but I think you can raise a lot of ways of things that other might pull that down. And so I think that the, the experts here are sort of integrating not just these two studies, but the whole context of the literature. And so I, I, I think this is actually, this is very close to where I would, my judgment would be that we're somewhat higher than Capital 2014, which we, I was essentially the same as the IPCC fifth assessment report. There's a very fat tail, uh, but, you know, so you end up with a, this dry out distribution. I don't think, you know, I don't think DeCanto and Pollard 2016 is right, and DeCanto and Pollard don't either, but it highlighted some areas of deep uncertainty that we needed to be prepared for. Okay, thank Bye. you. Um, there will be time for questions at the end, but...
Thank you. Um, so thank you. Uh, pleasure to be here today. Uh, I will not be anywhere near the science that Bob just gave you. Um, my role at Monmouth, I, I, uh, I'm associate director of a science-based policy institute, so I have one foot in the science and policy. Uh, but I also do quite a bit of work for the Sea Grant program in New Jersey where uh, we try to translate those science into the communities uh, to let them understand what impacts they may see in the future. So uh, th this is a little outgrowth of that work uh, where um, communities realize uh, quite evidently residents in these low-lying coastal communities have seen change. They don't dispute the idea that sea level is rising, uh, but they really don't understand uh, what will the future hold for them, and, and that's where they're kind of concerned. Uh, most of my work is in New Jersey, but I, I've taken this case study here in um, Queens around Hamilton Beach and Howard Beach, a very well-known hotspot for tidal flooding in New York City. Um, and uh, there's been quite a bit of work done in this community. This community has actually been engaged since Sandy on trying to address their issues. Uh, the, the plot here on the left, uh, this is a, from the Nature Conservancy report on possible nature-based solutions to uh, chronic flooding in this area, showing the storm surge extent of Sandy. So this is the extreme, and this is what the community experienced, kind of riled them to action to some extent. And on the, the right side is uh, a plot from the uh, New York City Planning uh, Office on Resilient Neighborhoods, where they're trying to estimate when will we see daily flooding, or where will daily flooding be located in these communities in 2050. And so, uh, when you go into the communities and, and look at these, they, they understand the spatial variability, uh, but to them they don't understand exactly what that means outside their front door. And so um, the issue that they're grappling with is we know sea level has been rising one and a half to three times uh, the historical uh, sea level rise rate in the past, over the last two and a half decades, and so they are seeing their streets flood more often. They're moving their cars more often. Um, and we have some great data in this region to really look at downscaling the impacts very locally. So this is the tide gauge um, mean sea level trend at Sandy Hook, New Jersey, uh, over the last century, which is about 1.34 feet of sea level rise over the prior 100 years. And so uh, this elevation in the sea level is raising the playing field and reducing the gap between mean high or high water and your ground outside your house. But what does that translate into a community? And so this was an event we had um, back in March of 2018, uh, very minor nor'easter that came up the coast. Uh, this is from a tide gauge at Bergen Basin run by Stevens Institute of Technology, which is just to the east of Hamilton Beach. And during this event, um, the minor flood level, which is four feet above the geodetic datum, was exceeded about eight times. And so uh, there was a lot of question about why this storm was so impactful, why there were so many impacts. And so we did a quick analysis to look at, well, when we look at varying sea level rates over the history of our uh, tide record, what would it mean? And so there was a particularly nasty storm in 1962 that impacted this area, uh, similar nor'easter. And so we adjusted the sea levels down to 1962, which is the uh, green line in this plot and I've indicated the minor, moderate, and major flood thresholds at this location. And we see that if the same storm occurred in 62, uh, the minor flood level would have been exceeded maybe two, three times. We look forward and add that same sea level rise and project out, and this is about over a 56 year period, uh, if the same storm occurs in 2074, which is the red line, well now we exceed the minor flood threshold almost 12 times, the moderate threshold three times. And so same storm, different impacts, right? And so this is something that communities can kind of start to relate to in terms of understanding specific storms, which is what they consider. They don't really, you know, when somebody says, should I move my car? They're gonna ask you, how bad was it, how bad will this storm be compared to the one we had two years ago? And so uh, this kind of time relation of experience is important. But one thing they are noticing among that storms and other impacts is that uh, they are more and more often not able to go out of their house or go out of their communities in these very low-lying areas due to even 
spring high tide flooding, what we call nuisance flooding. Um, and as that nuisance flooding becomes more and more frequent, um, the Union of Concerned Scientists, for instance, says chronic flooding uh, is when your community floods 26 times per year. That's about twice a week, or every two weeks, sorry. Um, uh, and that's a real low threshold for some of these communities. They're already experiencing that, right? So, uh, and then you add the storm surges on top of that, and then you, you really need to look at this joint distribution, sea level rise and storms, um, because those two combined things are gonna result in many more days like this. And so we just saw the sea level rise projections. Uh, we can downscale that locally to understand how much more frequently we should expect flooding in our communities, and then start to think about how this, the storms are gonna influence that. Uh, we do have quite a bit of data. Again, we're in a data-rich area. We actually have a uh, tidal prediction station in uh, Broad Channel, or actually North Channel, just to the south of this community. Uh, we have a number of benchmarks. There's actually, uh, this photo shows a location of a tidal benchmark uh, in Marina along Cross Bay Boulevard. Um, and uh, uh, when we look at the uh, elevations here, uh, we see that, for instance, that tidal benchmark in the parking lot off Cross Bay Boulevard uh, sits four feet above the geodetic datum, NABD 88. Uh, another real important location is uh, 104th Street, which is really the only access way in and out of Hamilton Beach for emergency vehicles, and that also sits at four feet, NABD 88. And so when we look at flood thresholds, and we go back to that flood we had in March of 19, or 2018, um, four feet was the flood threshold for minor flooding. And so if we go back and look at, say, the last 20 years of data from Sandy Hook, water level observations, high and lows, we can not only look at the sea level impacts, but reconstruct the high tide levels. And so uh, this is a process that's been done by uh, a number of researchers recently, Preble uh, et al. in 2015, Sweet et al. in NOAA in 2016, basically taking the historic records and then adding sea level to them to see what will happen in the future. And when you do that, you get a probability distribution over, this is a 20 year period, of uh, exceedance of each high tide relative to the national uh, North American vertical datum of 88 or the geodetic datum. So here we're looking at water level over land, basically. And so what we expect, uh, all of the tides, high tides, are above low tide, which is about negative 1.6 feet in a BD88. Um, and about 50% of them uh, fall within uh, about two and a half feet, 2.4 feet. So this is the tidal range right now in this community, but you can see off to the uh, right of these plots, uh, you have this tail, this long tail, and these are all the storm events that occurred over the last 20 years in terms of high tide records. And I've been indicated the four foot flood, flood threshold here, <laughs> easier for me to say. Uh, when I go into communities, the probability distribution immediately, they blank. <laughs> I don't wanna hear any more of my conversation. So we convert these into number of high tides per year. So we take that probability distribution it's about 730 high tides per year in the region, and we get a number of high tides that exceed a certain elevation per year. And so right now in this uh, Hamilton Howard Beach area, uh, the four foot flood threshold is exceeded about 73 times per year based on the historic water level observations. And that's based on the last sea level epoch. Uh, if we look at the projected sea level rise rates. So here we're looking at the New York Panel on Climate Change report that just came out. Uh, they really didn't mo modify their sea level rise projections very much from the 2015 report. Um, they did add the extreme water level that uh, Bob just talked about as a projection. Um, but if we just look at the middle range, so I'm just gonna take this middle range and say, well, what's the mean here? And look at these four sea level rise projections to see what the community is looking at in terms of number of high tide floods per year in the future. And we get something like this. So a couple of things to note here, the blue curve out here to the left is the existing sea level, the number of high tides uh, per year over certain elevations. And then we can project out. And so this, the varying sea level rise rates for different periods, uh, 2020, 20, 
50, 2080, and then 2100, based on those mid-range sea level rise projections, uh, we see that this bell curve shifts quite dramatically to the right. And I also want to note this slope is steep. And so the impacts aren't linear. The impacts are exponential, right? And so very quickly, these communities in 2020, for instance, if we look at the sea level rise projections, uh, should very soon be seeing something like 160 high tide floods per year. In 2050, we're at 400. That's every other high tide. So we're, we're moving towards the permanent inundation that Bob just talked about. And certainly by 2080 and 2100, these communities will be impacted every day. And so the question is, what does that community want in their future, right? I think we often think about we can build great barriers like this and cut off the communities from the environment. However, um, is that what they want? Or if we allow the community to elevate and stay there uh, and allow the water to flood the streets, then there's a quality of life issue. Can I get out of my house? I'm going to have to make my whole schedule around the tide tables. These become very practical implications. And so at some point, a decision is needed in this community in particular about when it's no longer viable as a community to stay there. And so uh, when we put it in kind of these terms, uh, we do find uh, the discussion is generated where they can relate what they see outside their window during high tide and the days they need to move their car to how many times they need to do that in the future. And uh, that, that begins the discussion of what options do we have. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Facing higher sea levels and flooding the case study broad channel east of New York City. Well, the uh, previous two talks set the stage really for, for this one. We'll just be looking at um, a uh, neighboring community, Howard Beach, um, in Jamaica Bay that uh, is already experiencing a lot of um, nuisance flooding. Uh, and um, as, as we've heard, uh, we'll, be doing, uh, we'll be facing more in the future. Now, Broad Channel is a, a rather small community, an island in uh, the um, in Jamaica Bay, uh, surrounded by the uh, Gateway National Recreation Area, and um, it, it it's a very closely knit community uh, that I'm sure that many of the families have lived there for many generations, and um, like many other closely knit neighborhoods, uh, one can imagine that these folks do want to stay. Uh, in the place. It's quite uh, a uh, lovely, lovely little community, uh, very peaceful, and quite a contrast to New York City. It almost has a rural um, uh, flavor or, or of, of that of a, almost like a New England uh, fishing village. Anyway, um, it's very vulnerable um, to tidal flooding even today and, and will be more so in the future with sea level rise. It's very low-lying, uh, just a few feet above sea level. Uh, as, as I mentioned, sea f uh, street flooding is already uh, a common um, affair, affair. And also, the houses are very uh, closely built to each other, so there is not that much room for uh, retrofitting, but there are plans um, to raise the streets and take other adaptation measures as we will see um, shortly. 
And, and these were just some illustrations of the street flooding that, that they um, have been experiencing in recent years. And sea level rise will pose an increasing problem. We've already heard about uh, the potential of uh, ice sheet destabilization in Antarctica and accelerating ice and glacier losses. And um, they will have difficulties in adapting to these future challenges. Now, um, as part of the New York panel on climate change, uh, we have examined uh, future sea level rise uh, scenarios. And um, this is just a, a quick overview of the study that we did in uh, 2015, which has become the basis of uh, uh, advanced climate change planning in, um, uh, for New York City. And now we're looking at, uh, more recently, we've been looking at a more extreme um, sea level rise scenario uh, in part based on the recent trends that uh, we have seen in, in uh, la uh, land ice, uh, the retreat of, of glaciers on a worldwide basis, increasing ice mass losses from Greenland and Antarctica, and the potential for um, West Antarctic ice sheet um, destabilization. And, and these are just uh, uh, illustrations of two possible uh, mechanisms that might contribute to those uh, instabilities. One is the marine ice sheet instability, another ice cliff uh, instability that were part of the uh, decanto Pollard paper that was uh, mentioned in conjunction with this. And so we developed this Antarctic rapid ice melt scenario based on these recent studies. And although uh, it's a very low probability event, it does have uh, high potential impacts. And therefore, it is something that uh, planners should uh, examine or consider, uh, even although decisions do not have to be made at this point on this particular scenario, but it's just showing where these um, um, recent climate trends may be leading to higher than formally expected um, sea level rise um, than, than had been formally thought. And this is just a, uh, a brief um, summary of compar comparison of the um, uh, NPCC report of 2015 versus this uh, upper end um, sea level rise scenario. And as uh, Bob Kopp mentioned earlier, um, up to about the 2050s, um, most sea level rise scenarios are, are fairly uh, in good agreement uh, with each other and the great divergences occur further into the future, uh, especially for the high uh, upper end um, carbon emissions, the, um, for example, the RCP um, 8.5 um, uh, emission scenario. And so um, sea level rise in New York City um, uh, may, uh, is expected to rise a little faster than than on a global basis for various reasons that we won't go into uh, right now. But um, by, the 20, by 2100, there's a small possibility that um, uh, sea level rise could uh, approach um, three meters. Uh, but it's a very slim chance. But however, to keep in mind, even although this may not occur, it's very unlikely to occur by 2100, it could uh, occur maybe several centuries into the future because sea level rise uh, will not end in 2100. It is an ongoing process because of the carbon uh, dioxide that is already accumulated in the atmosphere. And, and this just shows um, uh, a different way of looking at how the 100-year uh, flood zone will evolve over time as sea level rises in Jamaica Bay and um, just to point out, um, uh, Broad Channel is right in the middle of the uh, I, uh, Big Island, uh, right in here. I mean, almost in the middle of, of Jamaica Bay. And 
the um, purplish uh, area is the FEMA's 100-year uh, flood zone, the current 100-year flood zone. The greens and yellow show um, the um, future landward encroachment of the 100-year flood zone with sea level rise based on the uh, NPCC uh, projections of 2015. And the outer fringes of, of that reddish-brownish area uh, represent the further extension of the landward extension of the 100-year flood zone uh, in the more extreme Aram uh, scenario. And in one respect, New York is, is luckier than, say, Miami or um, um, New Orleans. Uh, it's saved by its topography. The, the very low areas are the first to get flooded, uh, even under the more moderate sea level rise scenarios. And uh, by the time you get to even these extreme uh, sea level rise scenarios in the future, uh, you, you're sufficiently high to be out of the 100-year flood zone. So there is room for relocation should that become necessary. Uh, it's not like Holland. They are stuck where half the, uh, the land or more uh, is already <laughs> is, is under sea level. And here is a, a more acute problem, that of the tidal flood zone expansion over time with sea level rise. And uh, there, uh, this is uh, based not on the, the NOAA's mean monthly uh, high water, but rather the mean monthly uh, high water. And, and that's uh, basically the spring tides. Um, so broad, broad Channel will probably be facing um, monthly tidal flood zone uh, in a, um, flooding way before we reach the uh, before uh, 2100. And perhaps by that time, even on, under the uh, NPCC 2015 scenarios, they may be experiencing daily uh, flooding uh, in some parts of, of the island and also the neighboring communities, as we've just heard. So the question then is, how can they adapt? Because I believe that this is a community that, unlike Staten Island, uh, they do want to remain in place as long as they can. And so there are some plans. The city is planning to retrofit um, some of the buildings uh, and um, change the zoning laws to make this uh, more possible, also to reduce the uh, limit the number of people living there and limit new construction. They, there are plans to um, elevate some of the frequently flooded streets, strengthen the bulkheads and raise seawalls, and also to develop more water-related uh, activities. There is restoration of salt marshes on Jamaica Bay, which have deteriorated uh, during the 20th century, and uh, this replanting of native vegetation along the shore. And here's, here's an illustration of the salt marsh restoration already underway in Jamaica Bay, the replanting of the, the adding of sand to the islands and uh, replanting of the marsh grass. And, and this is just a sketch illustrating the street raising um, plans that uh, are soon to be implemented, we hope, in Broad Channel. However, uh, what about the future? Um, how much longer will they be able to hold on? Uh, first of all, they need to be aware of the, the flood risks beyond the 2050s. I mean, they probably will be all right until then, you know, with these measures that are already underway. The, the big challenge will be what happens during the second half of the century. And maybe uh, use some innovative ideas like uh, perhaps considering uh, a more aquatic lifestyle. Perhaps the streets may become canals, as in Venice or Amsterdam, or as the Dutch do, you know, perhaps build multi-purpose levees that, that um, not only shield you from 
um, sea level rise, but can also create new um, living spaces and or, or have uh, buildings or communities that are floating so that even if the tides rise, the buildings rise with them. And, and as we've seen in Staten Island and other places, um, perhaps uh, increase the buyouts and, and return the land to the uh, natural state. But um, ultimately, they, they may need to consider managed relocation. The, the big questions are when and where, where will they go? And, and as you know, I'm not prepared to answer those two questions. I'm sure those are covered elsewhere uh, in this meeting. Thank you. Well, the, in other words, perhaps uh, increase the ex uh, boat accessibility. In other words, you know, like parts of the city, uh, you, you could commute by uh, ferry, for example. You know, maybe introduce ferry uh, systems. You know, at the moment, the only two ways they can get on and off the island are either with the uh, Crosstown uh, Parkway and, and also the A train, the subway. And... Uh, you know, let's say if you um, set up a, a, um, a ferry dock, then, you know, they could commute by boat. And many of them already uh, have boats, and, and they, you know, use the bay for fishing and, and, and just sailing and what have you. Thank you. Um, the work that I'm presenting has been part of a project that I've been working on um, during a six month research visit at the CUNY Institute for Demographic Research, which was in collaboration with my home university in Kiel, Germany. And in this project, I'm assessing or I'm exploring the potential impacts that sea level rise may have on migration in the Mediterranean region. And I'm specifically concentrating on um, analyzing dif different adaptation strategies and how these may affect population migration. The starting point of this work was that current coastal impact adaptation and vulnerability assessments on a regional to global scale usually account for different increases in sea level rise, so different sea level rise scenarios, and also recently have started to account for um, the changes in spatial distri uh, population distributions to account for the potential impacts of sea level rise. But none of these actually account for how sea level rise may affect spatial population change. And what we can say is that sea level rise will affect population migration, and the migration intensity and patterns will depend on the adaptation strategies that are pursued. And if we do not account for adaptation in coastal impact assessments, we potentially over or also underestimate the risks of sea level rise. So the study um, pursues two aims. The first one is to explore how sea level rise can affect migration until 2100 under a range of adaptation and sea level rise scenarios. And we're specifically interested in how many people will have to migrate, where these people will migrate from, and where they will actually go to. And the second aim of the study is to assess the implications of these population movements on population exposure to sea level rise related impacts and to also in turn inform policy making on what the um, spatial outcomes of different adaptation strategies may be. The, yeah, our study region is the Mediterranean region, and this is because we have a high um, population concentration in the coastal zone, and we also have large differences in adaptive capacity across the region, which makes it uh, particularly interesting to look at this region. Um, the coastal adaptation literature differentiates three adaptation strategies. We heard about these uh, this morning already, um, and I think that most of you are familiar with these. So we differentiate protection, accommodation, and retreat. And 
Um, all of these three strategies can be either autonomous, that means they happen on an individual or a household level, or they can be planned, referring to the policy level. And this is what we are particularly interested in within this study. As a first step, we develop adaptation scenarios, which are broad scale scenarios with large differences in the adaptation strategies pursued. Um, scenario A, build with nature. Scenario B, do nothing. And C, hold the line. And in order to develop more specific assumptions for these adaptation scenarios, we use and interpret the socioeconomic developments that are described under the shared socioeconomic pathways, the SSPs. And um, out of the five SSPs that have been developed by the research community, we select three, SSP 1, 3, and 5, because these are the ones that fit best to our adaptation scenarios. In this table, you can see our adaptation assumptions. Um, the upper half of the table, um, the first four lines show the um, adaptation assumptions that we just take over from the SSPs and interpret based on the SSPs to, them, to then develop our adaptation assumptions that you can see in the second half of the table. So under the build with nature scenario, which we interpret based on SSP1, we have moderate to high GDP. High in, internet, uh, high in effective international cooperation, and policies to, um, oriented towards sustainability and rapid technological change. So our adaptation assumptions are based on this, that um, adaptation policies will be oriented toward nature-based solutions, um, adapt adaptation funds will be high, and technological barriers to adaptation will be low. And the adaptation strategies that are mainly pursued under this scenario are managed retreat, setback zones, the restoration of coastal ecosystems, and a protection of only densely populated locations. Under the do-nothing scenario, we have low GDP and international cooperation, um, policies that are oriented towards security, and slow technological change, leading to no adaptation policies at all, no adaptation funds, and high technological barriers to adaptation. And the adaptation strategies then are mainly on the household level, um, small-scale protection measures, and also autonomous retreat. And the hold the line scenario, we have high GDP, high and effective international cooperation, and um, policies that are oriented toward economic growth and rapid technological change, leading to um, adaptation policies that are oriented toward highly um, engineered solutions, um, very high adaptation funds, and low technological barriers to adaptation. And the adaptation strategies are focused on hard protection measures and large-scale solutions. In the next step, we then quantify these um, qualitative adaptation assumptions and implement them in a population downscaling model to produce spatial population um, projections until the year 2100. And based on these, we can then um, determine how many people will have to migrate and what these pa the patterns would look like. And the model that, I, that we're using has been developed by the CUNY Institute for Demographic Research and the National Center for Atmospheric Research, and it uses a gravity-based modeling approach, which means that um, densely populated locations are more attractive for human settlement than less densely um, populated locations. And the model is calibrated to historical population data, and it uses a distance decay function in order to determine um, the attractiveness of any given place for human, um, for human settlement. This is what you can here uh, see in this, this part of the figure. And based on this, um, a population potential surface is um, calculated, which then serves as a basis to determine the new population distribution. And this model has been developed on a global scale with a, uh, with a resolution of 14 kilometers. We use this model and we add our adaptation assumptions to it. Um, because we work on a, on a regional scale, we um, focus on protection and retreat. Uh, to then be able to deduce which areas will be permanently inundated due to sea level rise and also which areas will be prone to storm surge flooding. In order to do so, we downscale the model to a resolution of approximately one kilometer, and we run the model with three sea level rise scenarios in 10-year time steps, and those are based on um, the scenarios that Bob Cobb just, pre uh, just presented. 
and we compare our results um, to a no sea level rise scenario and a no adaptation scenario in order to be able to tease out the effects of sea level rise on migration and also of adaptation on migration. Unfortunately, I'm still in the process of calibrating the model, so I will only be able to show you some preliminary results of what I've done so far. Um, so we have quantified our adaptation assumptions on protection, and for this we use the Dynamic Interactive Vulnerability Assessment Modeling Framework, which is a global scale framework, and this has just recently been downscaled to the Mediterranean region. And within this framework, or it is based on a database that um, splits the coastline into segments. And these segments have different lengths and have different socioeconomic and physical characteristics attached to them. And this is what you can see also to give you an idea um, in this figure here. Um, so the coastline of the Mediterranean is represented by almost 12,000 segments. And um, we determine dike locations and heights for each of these segments based on a demand for safety function. And this um, assumes that a society's demand for safety increases with its income and also with the number of people that are exposed to storm surge flooding. In this map, you can see um, the dikes implemented under the build with nature scenario and then the resulting permanent inundation in those areas that are not protected. And this um, map shows the Nile Delta. And what you can see here is um, even under the build with nature scenario, we have very many dikes. Um, and this is um, in this case due to the fact that um, the yeah, the Nile Delta is the most densely populated region within the whole Mediterranean region, and that's why we have like unusually many, uh, unusual many, many dikes, I would say, yeah. Um, under the do-nothing scenario, we don't have any dikes that are implemented, so you can see that large areas of the Nile Delta would be permanently inundated due to sea level rise. And under the hold the line scenario, almost the entire Nile, Nile Delta would be protected um, leaving only um, some areas that would be permanently inundated. Um, the other thing that I've done is I've used these um, permanent inundation characteristics and um, overlaid those with the current population distribution just to get an idea of where most migrants will um, come from in the future. Um, and we, yeah, I have defined migration hotspots based on the number of people who would have to migrate, and um, I defined those as more than 100,000 people who would have to migrate um, per coastal segment. And what you can see under the build with nature scenario is that we have seven migration hotspots in the year 2100. Um, this looks very different under the do nothing scenario where we have uh, 21 migration hotspots that are um, spread all over the, the Mediterranean basin, and especially a high concentration in the Nile Delta. And uh, under the hold the line, we only have six uh, migration hotspots, which is because most parts, um, of, yeah, most parts of the coastline will be protected. But what we have to keep in mind here is that um, we do not account for the gradual um, migration that will take place um, in the course of the century. So this is just an I this just gives us an idea of what this um, might look like. And also, so far, we've only implemented a protection. Other adaptation strategies are not accounted for in these maps. So what, I, it's, or what we expect to see once we run the model is that uh, under the build with nature scenario, we will have a high number of migrants, especially until um, the mid of the century because of the other adaptation strategies that will be pursued, like managed retreat, um, setback zones, and the restoration of coastal ecosystems. Um, Migration patterns will be primarily into inland locations and also into urban areas, and uh, which means that the residual risk regarding the impacts of sea level rise is low, just because people will move away from the coast. Um, under the do-nothing scenario, we also expect to see a high number of migrants in, that will increase with increasing sea level rise. Pri migration will be primarily directed into inland locations, and residual risk is still moderate to high because we expect that people will only move once the um, impacts of sea level rise are felt. Are felt. So it's um, reactive migration instead of proactive migration. <coughs> 
And under the hold the line scenario, we expect to see a low number of migrants, some increase with sea level rise in those locations that are not protected, and migration patterns primarily into urban areas and little migration into inland areas. So that means that the residual risk would be high. Um, what we can already say is that the adaptation strategies um, pursued will influence sea level rise and use migration considerably. And what I would like to point out is that a high number of migrants does not necessarily mean that it's negative because um, under the, uh, under the build, build with nature scenario, we have a highly um, resilient, yeah, this is a highly resilient scenario, so that means we don't have high vulner vulnerability because people move proactively. Um, on the other hand, if we have low, a low number of migrants, this may also indicate that we have high residual risk due to the um, or to sea level rise related impacts. The method that we're using um, can be applied to other, reg uh, other regions as well. It's quite easy to apply it to those regions, and it also allows for integrating other um, climate change impacts in addition to sea level rise to see how these may affect migration. And also another thing that um, should be done is also to include socioeconomic variables in order to be able to actually account for vulnerability and not just pure population numbers. Um, thank you very much. No. Um, yeah. So this, um, as I said, also these the, the scenarios that we use are rather broad scale scenarios, and they um, we ha make some, um, yeah, we make assumptions that we can also actually implement in the model. And because it's a large scale model, we cannot um, implement smaller scale processes that would take place. Um, yes, so um, the way we implement it is primarily on a spatial basis. So we, we look at where we have dikes, for example, and then um, determine which areas would be permanently inundated, and those areas would be areas where uh, we'd say that people will not be able to live anymore. So they will have to move away from these areas. Um, the same goes for what I haven't uh, um, implemented yet, goes for the managed retreat. Um, I would then determine areas that are um, prone to um, regular coastal flooding to then, um, and, that, and then that these areas would also not be available for human, settle, uh, yeah, for human settlement anymore, and that would also mean that people would have to move away. Um, the model itself um, does not, um, yeah, it, it you cannot model migration with a model itself. So the model just produces, pop or it produces population projections, and then based on those, we can determine um, what, like, how people have migrated due to sea level rise. It's a bit difficult to explain, I'm sorry, but um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, it's just an exploration of different strategies and what their effect might be on spatial population, yeah. <laughs> 
Um, good question. Uh, so there, there are, I think there's two different angles on that. So one is, will the modeling improve? Well, the modeling, I think, is improving fairly rapidly. The challenge is that the modeling currently indicates uh, that it may be hard to tell, even if we have the physical processes, which course we're on, unless we really can narrow, like it has to improve a lot for us to be able to say now when the, there are processes not in play at all that could be important rather than any importance, right? So um, in our 2017 paper, um, we found that basically, based on what we currently understand, a sort of sea level course headed for two meters at the end of the century is essentially indistinguishable from one headed towards half a meter until about the 2040s or 2050s. Um, so I think if, the, if our understand, as our understanding of physics of the ice sheets improves, right, that may change. But you know, the, the pro if the processes aren't going to kick in until later, we're still going to run into some substantial challenges there. Yeah, so, so there, there's uh, two different things to uh, basically to keep in mind, right? So one, uh, the sort of physically easier one is as you move ice around, you're changing the gravitational field of the Earth, you're changing the Earth's rotation, you're causing deformation. And so that has a spatial pattern that is relatively well predicted. Um, you know, honestly, a good chunk of the, the initial theory of, from that dates to the late 19th century and a lot of the follow-on series dates to the 1970s, um, although there have been refinements since then. Um, the more difficult part uh, is how that meltwater affects atmosphere ocean dynamics, right? So the coupling between what's going on in the ice sheets and what's going on in the ocean. Um, there are important effects in both the Southern Ocean um, and uh, particularly in the North Atlantic between Greenland melt and Antarctic melt and uh, sea level change. Um, and that's an area where I think there, there's a lot of improvements going on. We're starting to see the first uh, global coupled simulations uh, in the last few months uh, being published. Um, so that, that's an area where I think there, there's more work that will happen, but I think there, there's a lot of, of rapid, that's area expected a lot of rapid advance over the next few years. You're talking about policy scaling? I mean, I, I wasn't at the, the symposium yesterday. Okay, solution scaling. Okay, got it. No, because I think on, the, on the technical side, I think that, that that's a solvable problem. Um, I, I mean, perhaps to, to some of my other other colleagues to talk about that. But I, I mean, I think it seems to me that a lot of the, on the adaptation, that a lot of things are, do have to happen locally. And then what the, the higher level policy can do is sort of encourage the development of sort of the, the, the local institutions that facilitate that. Um, I happen to think that the academic institutions, particularly public and land grant universities, have a really important potential role to play um, in helping build those sorts of grassroots networks. But yeah, I, I mean, it's a, it's a different. It is a different type of problem than mitigation. The the only the only thing that I would 
comment on at this point is that, it, say, for example, in New York City, that the resiliency planning um, takes into account, you know, the different needs of different neighborhoods so that even although the city is involved, uh, let's say, in the resiliency planning, uh, there's also a lot of um, neighborhood groups that participate in these discussions to um, outline their, need, their specific needs and also the adaptations that would arise from that. I think why, why is there that difference? I, I was wondering that myself, actually, because I, I think that in most of these com, uh, coastal communities, not just New York, but everywhere along the coast, I mean, look at all the development that's gone on on the barrier islands all the way from uh, Long Island down to uh, Miami and then the Gulf Coast. Uh, it's wall-to-wall -wall condominiums in many places. I mean, clearly, and, and if you look at, at NOAA's population, uh, growth analysis, uh, th they've had these reports every number of years, that there's been a demographic shift, population shift uh, toward the coasts uh, over the last 50 uh, or more years, uh, in spite of hurricanes and other storms and things of that sort. So people do want to live along the coast and do want to rebuild after a storm. They're not particularly eager to move, at least not yet. I mean, it depends how many storms will, uh, and damages will they tolerate, how, how much will they get from the, um, the FEMA NFIP program, you know, to rebuild, um, you know, when will the national flood insurance no longer uh, be effective? Uh, th these are kinds of questions that would determine uh, when um, coastal uh, uh, managed re uh, relocation will be needed. But I think people want to stay in place for the most part. So just to, to add to that comment, um, one, one interesting thing about this local region, Broad Channel, Hamilton Beach, um, Howard Beach, uh, they are residential communities. So a lot of these communities up and down our eastern seaboard are very seasonal in nature, second homes. Uh, there's a little more risk uh, acceptance for that because you have your own home back home. Uh, but these communities seem to stay here because that's where they want to be, and that's going to be a challenge to, for any migration scenario. Mm -hmm. You know, the people in Staten Island, the community in the west, and Britain are still very relatively detached from the community of where they were going to move away from when the Great Depression struck. A lot of them were taken over by co ops, condos. Channel people look at this situation and say, there's no place they can go to that they feel like they can go to. And that's just not the case. So it's sad for them, but it's really the general generation that has taken a lot of what's been done here. So I think it's going to be um, very difficult. Um, there was some other hands up. Yes, Jennifer. So this is Jennifer from Staten Island. So IPCC is going to assess the literature that's available, and that will include a few coupled studies. It's not going to include a lot uh, because the, the cutoff deadline is something has to be submitted by December 31st of this year for, for con consideration. Um, consideration of high-end storylines and potential high-end outcomes is certainly some, I think that's a criticism uh, that the fifth assessment report um, got a lot of quite fairly. Um, you know, that was one of the, the premises in our paper uh, of trying to assess further into the tails of the probability of distribution of sea level rise was because 
you know, knowing only the 83rd percentile and nothing above it is, is incomplete knowledge. Um, so I think there's, there's attention to both of those issues. It's going to be constrained by what, what you can say based on the peer-reviewed literature, but, but I think there is definitely going to be more attention in the six assessment report uh, to, to at least seeing, seeing how it's possible to incorporate higher uh, projections, discussion of those. But, but, but I, 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 I should have, right, so, so the other thing is before the six assessment report, there is a special report on oceans, uh, cryosphere, and, and climate, which is, uh, what has, is in final government review now. Um, so for those of us on AR6, it's been sort of an interesting issue because the SROC, as we call it, was still assessing the literature while we were starting to get started on the next report. And so the handoff is, has been uh, something that's, that's been focused for, for those of us on, on that part of it. Um, Yeah. So, so, but, but I, th but I think so. There's a, there's a, you know, we can assess what's in the literature. There's also the framing issue, right? Are we attentive to, to this need and this need? And so, people, people are certainly aware of the criticism that has been received. Yeah. Yeah. the attachment what to the community yeah of wanting to stay and how that might change in the future well uh, it depends on on <laughs> their tolerance of, uh, of flooding and how much can be done to alleviate it uh, there may be limits to uh, what you can do uh, on, on such a low-lying uh, small island that's already uh, very uh, developed or settled, that there's not that much land uh, in that particular location uh, for people to migrate to, uh, although they can move elsewhere in the city. I mean, there are plenty of places, but it's hard, you know, to move the entire community. Part of Italy is um, Naples, so, so Naples. yeah, that's the city of Naples, and about Egypt, um, yeah. I'm also, to be honest, I'm also surprised about this because, um, yeah, I would also assume that the it's not very low lying area, but. Um, I guess it's because um, of the demand for safety function that we are using that these, there are some coastal segments that are not worth protecting. And then there are many people living in these segments um, that would then partially be exposed. So I guess this is why. Um, I'm still, as I said, I'm still working on, on the results. So I also have to look more into these um, to see whether also um, the dikes that we um, implement in the modeling actually make sense. Um, um, regarding the Nile Delta, we have been discussing about this a lot, um, also about how um, strongly to um, interpret our build with nature scenario, whether we should actually build dikes in that area, but this would mean that like, millions of people would have to migrate um, out of the Nile Delta. And this is something that's possibly not a plausible scenario. But we, um, yeah, 
as we haven't run the model yet, I'm very interested also in seeing the results, what the model says, where these people will, will end up. And we will only account for internal, internal migration within the model. Um, but you are right. I would also assume that uh, there must be some kind of um, international migration or there may be um, reason for some kind of international migration because large parts or large population groups of the Nile Delta uh, are living in the Nile Delta. But, um, oh, great. It's more in the Nile. And is the land also very low lying then? No, no, no. The land is low, but then there are people who can get to the people. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I was thinking about showing Venice as an example instead of the Nile Delta um, because um, there are large differences between the different scenarios. Um, under the Build with Nature scenario, basically nothing of the Venice Lagoon would be protected, but under the Hold the Lion scenario, almost all of the lagoon would be protected. So, um, yeah, there's just not that many people living in, in Venice. Um, that's why, yeah, it's, it's just based on what we now defined as a migration hotspot, it just doesn't pop up. I can, I can give a couple of thoughts. So in the U.S., um, the topography is pretty good. Um, outside the U.S., they're, they're, they're in Australia and Europe, um, there's not as good topography. So actually, that the space vertical uncertainty um, 
can have a pretty large effect on exposure estimates. Um, so uh, some work by colleagues at Climate Central suggests that improving global topographies sort of gives you a factor of two or so in, in population exposure estimates globally. Um, I think the temporal uncertainty estimate is actually, uncertainty is actually an, a really interesting and useful way of, of framing the problem. I mean, we know that, you know, see that the water level will get to six feet on the Jersey Shore. It already does, rarely. Uh, and that will become increasingly common over time. And the question is, like, when, do, when does that sort of happen? That's the, sort of, that's sort of the, the approach that Tom was talking about, the total water level approach. Um, you know, in our New Jersey sea level rise projection assessment report, we use the probabilistic framing to talk about over time, the uncertainty over time, to talk about um, sea level is not science. Um, but then the way that gets used is actually more in this total water level framework. So we talk about different levels that are salience and then when you know, uncertainty and when you might hit that. Um, and I, I do think that's, that's probably a, use, a useful way of framing. I'm not sure there's been any systematic studies on, on the effects of these different ways of framing. Um, there hadn't been a, over a couple of years ago. So uh, we, we don't really talk about uncertainty much. One, one of the big advantages we had is the work Bob's group has done on the projection of, of future sea levels with, if we just look out to 2050, we have a, a high certainty that, you know, a high probability that this is going to occur. We, if we stay within the, the mid-range estimates and just show people what that impact alone will be, um, they, they will react to that uh, without question. They won't say, oh, this is crazy. But when we start to look at 2100 and six feet, eight feet, that's where the, the, the uncertainty par paralyzes the community, right? At that point, they're, well, we can't do anything about eight feet of sea level rise. So um, we've focused on that, you know, 2020 to 2050 range as the time to do local adaptation. I think that was a great question earlier about uh, what what scale solution can you do? Obviously, local adaptations um, are limited, but have some value in the short term, and and hopefully that those mitigation efforts uh, allow you to get to when we make better decisions about our carbon emissions in the future and how we're going to reduce them. And so, uh, at the community level, we focus on that short term. Uh, the long term is is very difficult to explain. I mean, if one, one advantage is that, that it tends to be the longer term decisions are things more like infrastructure decisions where you do have more, more of a technical base of people involved. Um, so I would say Sandy has had a profound impact on the local communities where uh, they do realize the vulnerabilities and they do try to address them. Um, there is a limit to what they're, they will engage, but um, you know, I've talked to many Republican mayors in New Jersey on the coast that say we really need to do something. We really need to make ourselves more resilient. Uh, we can't depend on the federal government to protect us. So, so I think there's a, a balance there. Um, we're not seeing the really hard push against it, at least in our communities regionally. Do you see it? Uh, well, I, I was going to refer to uh, another uh, conservative community like uh, Norfolk, Virginia, uh, where uh, I'm sure there's a lot of cl uh, climate change denialers. But uh, the, uh, they do acknowledge the fact that nuisance flooding uh, is an increasing problem and that they have to deal with it. And uh, th they realize the local sea level is rising, but a large part of it is coming from land subsidence. So, uh, you know, they're not blaming climate and they don't care. I mean, the main thing is that, um, that there's a problem with street flooding and what do you do about it? So, so in other words, they take a more practical approach. They don't worry about what's causing it. I may add yeah. something. 
um, the experience also that we have from um, a project that we're involved in in the north of Germany, um, where we also try to um, support adaptation planning in a city in the north of Germany. Um, it's also that, um, at least in that city, we, we notice that people are just not aware of, of climate change or aware of what might happen due to sea level rise. So, um, at, at least that's the feedback that we got, is that people just want to know what the risks could be, and um, so we, yeah, model different um, floodplains for different increases in sea level rise and so on, just to give them an idea what this future may look like. It's just that, yeah, people don't know really, or many people just don't know um, what's, what might happen. <laughs> 